Hi, and welcome to module one of a brief introduction to game theory. In this module, we're going to talk about the building blocks that are present in all game theoretic models. Um, actually, these building blocks are present in all formal models to some degree, um, but we're going to focus on game theory here. The first one are actors. Sometimes these are called actors or players, if we're talking about games in particular. Um, regardless, these are the individuals, uh, these are the individual entities about whose behavior we care. These are the entities we're trying to model. These entities can be anything. They can be people, individual people. We're trying to understand individual people's behavior. And that's probably the most common um, use of game theory is to model an individual person's behavior. Um, or, in, or an individual person's behavior while acting with other individuals. Um, but they can also be groups, small groups of individuals. Or they can be larger groups. They can be cities, city governments, or state governments, or entire countries. Or they can be non-governmental organizations, or corporations, or really any gathering of individuals. The key is, when you assign an actor in your model, that actor is assumed to take an action as a whole, as a unitary body. So if I think in order to understand something, I must understand the behavior of each individual person, then I want my actor to be an individual person. If instead I want to understand the behavior of a city or a country, I might decide to make a simplifying assumption that that country or city behaves as a unitary whole and decides to take an action as a whole. So I am sort of glossing over all the different behavior of the individuals within that city or country and instead focusing on the city or country as a whole. It's a simplifying assumption, but all models are simplifications. And sometimes if you're really concerned about how cities or countries interact with each other, what the behavior is, we might have to simplify away from the individual behavior of individual people who make up those cities or countries. But those are actors. Now, there are different kinds of ways to capture actors, and I'm not going to use much math in this, in this lecture, but I'm going to use some. And I want to um, use some here because it's helpful to understand what's going on. So, one way to capture an actor is to refer to it by some index i. So here we might say there's um, an actor i, so an actor 1 or actor 2 or actor 3, and that i is an element of some set. This is a set element um, notation of some set n. Here n is some group of actors who are present in your model. And again, the group could be a group of individuals, a group of groups, a group of countries, a group of corporations, whatever. But n here captures the set of actors in your model. And each i over here, each i is an element of that set. I might save little n for the size of that set. So the cardinality of that set, the number of elements in that set. This kind of notation works pretty well when we have a discrete number of actors in our model, as we often do. It turns out that game theory um, gets more and more complex the more actors we have in our model. So typically you will see games that have two or three or, or maybe four individual discrete actors in them, but not too many more than that. Um, what they, no, I should say there are models, of course, with more actors than that, but you'll often see ones with just a relatively small number of actors. When you want to move to many actors, we often make a different simplifying assumption, which is that instead of a large number of discrete actors, we have a continuum of actors. A continuum here is just a region of, say, a line. This is a line segment from 0 to 1. So if you think of a number line here, if this is 0, and it goes on past 0, and this is 1, and it goes on past 1, 0 to 1 is, are all the points between 0 and 1 inclusive, so including the endpoints 0 and 1. When I say our actors are some set 0 to 1, what I'm saying is that we have a continuum of actors defined according to some line, some line segment. We'll see why it's helpful a little bit later, um, but the idea is, let's say I'm considering voters. 
like voter behavior. And let's say I want to assign each voter some policy preference that they would really like. And I'm going to simplify policy preferences by sending this in a line. You've probably seen this um, either in other classes or in just reading um, or watching TV in which we talk about left voters and right voters or conservative voters and liberal voters and so on. Um, what these um, simplifications of reality are are just ways of capturing how um, individuals feel what their sort of ideal preferences are in some abstract policy space. In this modeling framework, I can represent my actors as existing along some line segment in this abstract policy space. And the individuals closer to zero might be more conservative, and the individuals closer to one might be more liberal, or vice versa, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's arbitrary. In that case, we can represent our actors in our model as individuals along this line segment. So really, our actors can either be discrete actors, right? Your person one, your person two, your person three, and so on. And we explicitly model each individual's behavior. Or our actors can be some continuum of possible actors um, who exist along some continuous space, say a policy space. In this course, we're going to talk mostly, in this lecture, we're going to talk mostly about discrete actors, but I wanted to show you that there are continuous actors. Um, and they can be useful in understanding or modeling real behavior. Okay. Those actors, um, and again, they are actors or players, it doesn't really matter how you refer to them. They're just the individuals we care about uh, modeling in our model. The second building block here are actions. What can our actors do? The actions an actor can take are just the things that are available to the actor. Now, in real life, actors have tons of things available to us, right? Right now, I can do it absolute infinite number of things at the moment, right? But in the model, we don't want to capture everything possible an actor can do. We want to focus on the interesting choices an actor might make. So, as we'll see in, in, in a couple um, modules, if we're dealing with a situation in which we're trying to coordinate on some common action, we might consider only two or three possible coordination actions. Two or three possible actions that we might coordinate on. Or if we're trying to cooperate, we might consider cooperation and its opposite action, non-cooperation, or as we often call it in game theory, defection. We might consider a subset of all possible actions. We can call these actions or we can call these strategies. Well, again, strategies is more closely attached to players in the sort of game theoretic sense because game theory was derived from the theory of games. It is a theory of games, rather. It's a theory of trying to play games, how to play games optimally. So actions, um, we again can have a similar type of type of notation. We might let little s um, sub i be some element in some big S sub i. Now what does that mean? Well here, big S sub i are the set of all strategies or actions that actor or player i might take or has available to take in this model. Little s sub i is the particular action that actor i is taking, or it's an element in the set of all possible actions that i could take. This again is a discrete way of representing actions, and we often in game theory think about actions as discrete elements, right? We can do cooperate or defect. We can coordinate on option a or b or c. These are all discrete actions one might take. In contrast, um, we can also look at strategies in a continuous space. For instance, let's say I'm dealing with a continuous array of voters. And let's say I am a um, policymaker, and I'm trying to pick a policy that will appeal to the most number of voters. My strategy space there might be the same exact space as the voters. Maybe my strategy space in that case is, again, a continuous line segment. And if my policy I choose is zero, I'm going to make people closer to zero very, very happy. But the people closer to one might be very unhappy with me. In contrast, I could choose one instead, a policy closer to one instead, making the opposite people happy and unhappy. Or I could choose to split the difference and choose a policy closer to the middle of that space, maybe about one half, and make everyone a little unhappy, but the people in the middle happier. Where to locate on that policy space is a model 
of um, policy making or candidate location. In this case, my strategy space, my um, action space, is continuous because I can locate anywhere between zero and one. So again, actions can be can, can be discrete. They can be I can do A or B or C or cooperate or defect or what have you, or they can be continuous. I can choose any policy between zero and one. In all cases, though. The building block of the model this represents are the set of things each actor in your model can do. Now to note here that sub i is important. Each actor does not need to have the same actions. In most of the stuff we do in this lecture as an introduction to game theory, we're going to consider cases in which each actor has the same actions available um, to them. However, more generally, each, action can, each type of actor can have different kinds of actions. For instance, if I have a voting model with a candidate who locates in policy space, we might have voters whose actions involve vote for candidate A or vote for candidate B, but the candidate's actions could be locate on some policy space. So we could have different actions available to different types of actor. So we keep track of that by having that sub i which says actor type 1 does this, actor 2 does that or has options this or options that. Okay, um, the third building block here are the outcomes. Once each act actor takes their actions, what are the results of those actions? What happens at the end of all these actions being taken place? Again, outcomes um, can come from various spaces here. So one way we can write that is if there's a discrete number of, act of sort of actions, we might label it by um, well, it actually needs either case, it's probably easier just to call it x. So I'll call it x here. So x here is the space of all possible outcomes. It can be discrete, in which case we might write, and I gotta flip back here again, in this case we might write that um, we have some x sub j, which is an element of x, in which case what we're saying is that there's some outcome space x. And each uh, little x sub j is just an element of x, and we're saying x is discrete, so there's only a certain number of discrete outcomes that can happen. In a lot of the games we'll see, that's the case. We can get certain payoffs, that'd be 0, 1, 2, or 3, say, and you only have four possible pay outcomes, which you get a payoff of 0, 1, 2, or 3. Or we can have a continuum of outcomes, same notation there for x, it's still an outcome space, but now we just end up with some outcome little x, in capital X, and here we're just saying we could get, say, any outcome from 0 to 100, and little x is just some number between 0 and 100. That's a different kind of outcome. In the case of, say, a, um, a model of a voting model, maybe the candidates have discrete outcomes, either they win or lose, or maybe tie, so they have three possible discrete outcomes. But the voters might have very different outcomes based on the location in policy space that the candidate chooses, and maybe the closer the candidates end up, the winning candidate ends up to the voter, the happier the voter is and the better outcome the voter has. So actually the possible number of outcomes for the voters is continuous. It can be anything um, along some continuous space. These are outcomes. And finally, the last building block we want to talk about here are systems. This is everything else, really, in some senses. Um, not everything else, I should say, sorry. Everything exogenous, stuff that's the, that, that represents the context in which actors act. Right. So, for instance, is there some structure to how actors interact? Is there some form of this interaction in which actors have to engage in order to interact? A common example of this are models of bargaining, as we'll talk about later in this lecture. These are models in which individuals make an one individual makes an offer to the other individual, a bargain. The second individual can accept or reject. If the individual rejects, that individual makes a counter offer, and so on and so forth until someone either accepts or not, or some um, failure to bargain outcome happens. Failure to reach a bargain outcome happens. Um, in that case, part of the system here is the form of the interaction, often called a game, game theory, the form of the game that the players or the actors are playing. 
But systems can also represent exogenous parameters, things that exist in the real world that might affect how you make decisions. So for instance, let's say we're playing some kind of economic game, some kind of economic interaction. It's possible that my choices depend very much on whether or not the economy is good or bad. So we can have a dichotomous economy state. We call this the state of the world. The world can either be in a good economic state or in a bad economic state. We can represent that in the same way we're doing before. So we could set up this, um, this is a capital omega. I'm going to draw it now. That's a very badly drawn capital omega, but it's a capital omega. Um, and we can represent the state of the world in any given context as a lowercase omega, which is an element of this capital omega set. The example I just gave had only two possible outcomes. And that's supposed to be a curly brace. Um, good or bad. So either the state of the world is good or it's bad. And in any given case, that lowercase omega can equal good, G for good, or B for bad. And it's possible all the decisions you make in the game might depend very strongly on whether or not the economy is good or bad, as they do in real life. So um, these are ways of capturing the system, the system in which you exist, the context in which these actors are taking actions and receiving outcomes. And these, this, these systems can affect how actors interact um, and how they get outcomes and how they take actions. Okay. And that's really it. These things are very, very general. Actors, as we say, can be anything. Actions can be anything that you decide the actors can do that is meaningful to you. Not everything they can do, but some small subset that you want to focus on of their actions. Outcomes can mean anything. Anything that, you might, that actors might care about can be an act, outcome of some interaction, of a series of actions. And systems can also be anything. The state of the world can be anything that matters to how individual actors take their actions or receive their outcomes. So these are very general um, terms, very general building blocks, which is why I'm calling them building blocks, and also why they form the sort of basis for game theory, because we're going to build abstract formal models about how the world works from these building blocks. And we're going to see how to do that in a rough sense. Obviously, this is an introduction to game theory, um, a, a quick one, um, over the next uh, nine modules. Thank you very much.